Hello everyone, welcome to Stealing with Chantel. I'm Chantel and this is Ty. So this is the front of our ambulance and we wanted to give you a little bit of an inside look on what it looks like up here. You'll notice a bunch of buttons and different radios and things. There's a lot of cool technology that we get to deal with every single day. Um, everybody's personal favorite I think is definitely the lights. So all these buttons up here give us the ability to control different lights on the box. Um, even gives us the ability to use our sirens through the steering wheel horn, which is pretty cool. We've got the siren, another personal favorite. Uh, we've got all kinds of different sounds that it can make. We've got air horns, um, and then a couple different radios that you'll notice as well. This is the one that we get used to talk to dispatch, so if they give us a run, if we're letting them know that we're doing really anything, we'll communicate it through here. And then we also have the ability to kind of spy on some other agencies and listen to some other radio traffic as well through this one. So it's nice to know what's going on in other parts of the county too. Here, this is something kind of new to Jesmond EMS that we're really excited about. We're gonna have the ability here soon to, instead of having to call dispatch and talk to them to let them know every little thing that we're doing, there's gonna be a program on this phone where we'll be able to mark if we're in route, if we're on scene, that kind of thing. So it's gonna allow us to better manage our resources, better kind of keep track of our times. We're hoping too to be able to use this to communicate with the hospitals. There's an app called Pulsera that we're looking to get. We'll be able to send them pictures of the EKG to consult with physicians, use it to do stroke alerts. Um, if someone's having a heart attack, we can let the hospital know that that way. So a lot of cool technology, even just in the front of the ambulance, other than everyone's favorite radio and AC and that kind of thing, so. Alrighty, so we just kind of went through the front of the truck, so we'll go ahead and show you what the outside of the trucks look like too. Uh, so every single one of our boxes is a little bit different. The compartments are, um, they carry the same things, but they're just set up in different locations. So every morning when you're checking your truck, it's a good idea to go ahead and familiarize yourself with where each compartment is and what it's got on it. So for this one, uh, this one's actually pretty cool because it's actually got a machine that lifts our main oxygen tank in and out of the truck so we don't have to lift it uh, whenever we're replacing it. Every truck carries one main large tank which is what we use when we put the patients in the truck just to conserve some of these smaller tanks. We also always carry two spares with us on top of the two other tanks that we carry in the truck, just in case, because you never know what's gonna happen. Our next compartment is the stair chair here. So that's something that we can use to get patients in and out of the house. It essentially kind of works like a little wheelchair, but it's got tracks that kind of fold out on the back and we can use it to get patients down, up and down stairs if they can't walk. We also use it if they have really narrow um, hallways in their house that we can't get the stretcher in or out of and maybe they don't have a wheelchair that they can use to access that. That's a really cool little piece of equipment. Uh, this compartment also has our Lucas device in it, which we'll talk about a little in depth at another time. But that's what we use for mechanical CPR and our garbage can that's in there. It does have inside access too. Switchboards up here, uh, I'm not gonna lie, I couldn't tell you what every single one of these things does, but it is there. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> This compartment has several different purposes. Up there, we've got um, some helmets. So if we need to, if we're involved in any kind of like tactical rescue, or maybe in a scene where we're concerned about any kind of falling debris, like a wreck, 
or something along those lines. We've got helmets we can use. Up here, we have a bag that has several different types of air splints for like broken extremities or dislocations. We've got two of these. So basically this is like a really, really strong tarp. Um, it's got some kind of handles and straps on it that reinforce it and we can use this to carry somebody out of a house if we need to. Uh, we use them to lift people. It's, it's a really nifty piece of equipment. Nice too because the texture on it, it's like waterproof. Um, not the straps, but it's really easy to clean if for some reason it gets pretty messy. We carry a bunch of our different trauma stuff out here. So pelvic binder, if someone has some kind of a suspected pelvic fracture, we use this to kind of stabilize their pelvis and hopefully stop any bleeding. We carry two of these. And this is our little trauma go bag. Um, we carry tourniquets in here. We've got lots and lots of gauze, a chest seal, some tape, different kinds of bandages. And then if for some reason we need to needle decompress, so sticking a needle in between the ribs to decrease the pressure, maybe your lung is collapsed, um, we can use these for that. It's also got a Sharpie and we carry some different triage um, tags in here, different things for a mass casualty incident. So you'd be able to use this on a patient. You kind of mark any history that you may know, um, as well as what priority they are and any meds that you've given. So that way, if we do have a mass casualty situation, we can keep better track of our patients. Uh, different boards that we can use to immobilize patients, carry them out of the house, that kind of thing. And then this is something that we use for immobilization as well. Um, we've got these C collars which you can use to stabilize a patient's spine. It kind of goes under their neck and wraps around and helps keep everything in place. Um, some places use actual like foam blocks, but we use towel rolls. So what we do when we put you on a board, we'll put these kind of right next to your head and use tape to stabilize it. And that helps keep your head from moving and getting jostled around. Here, we've got a couple different assorted things. This is a CPR board. So if for some reason a patient's in a spot where we can't do good CPR on them, maybe we couldn't get them off a of bed or something like that, we can put this underneath of them. It gives us a hard surface to do compressions on. This is an infection control bag. It's got different kinds of like PPE in it so we can use for personal protection. Again, a bunch of different like splints that we can use for different kinds of injuries and in different parts of the body. And then the last one over here, you can access this one from the inside. Um, makes it really nice if you do need some kind of, need something that you usually use from like the outside and the inside. So this is a little, we kind of call it our Star Wars gun. Uh, we got this for COVID, and uh, I can't just show you what it does, I guess. So we fill this with a disinfectant solution. It attaches right in here. And after runs, you just kind of spray it throughout the truck and disinfect everything. So it's kind of just sprays a little mist over everything, and it really does look like something out of a sci-fi movie. This is what we use to transport kids. We can't safely uh, secure a car seat on the stretcher. So we basically put them in a little, I call it a little NASCAR harness. It kind of straps over their arms, um, straps them in at the hips, and then is secured to the stretcher that way. So this is the safest way that we can transport any kid. This is our PD bag. So any calls involving kids, we use this. It's got specialized equipment for like the tiny tykes. More PPE things, we've got gowns, masks, um, OB delivery kits here, more masks. This is our portable suction device, so we'll take that. And if we suspect that we're going to have to manage the airway, if there's any gunk in the airway that we need to get rid of, 
And then we just have a bunch of like blankets and sheets in there because you can never have too many of those. Hi, my name is Jamie Goodpastor. I'm the chief of Jessamine County EMS. All right, so first we're gonna start off with our ALS bag or our medic bag. And our advanced life support bag is really, it's used by basic life support providers and advanced life support providers. There's a few distinction, distinctions in EMS that we wanna talk about. One, we have EMTs, advanced EMTs and paramedics. EMTs are the bread and butter of EMS. They're kind of the people that own most of EMS, but the paramedics provide the most uh, sophisticated and highest level of care where the AEMTs kind of bridge that gap. They provide the intermediate care where an EMT just doesn't have the certification or the knowledge to, uh, to administer. And a paramedic might be a little bit above in knowledge and, uh, and uh, education, uh, but there's still a lot of skills that our advanced EMTs can provide. So all of them will work out of this bag. It's a really interesting bag. We have a lot of cool technology in here. Since we're talking about STEM, I like to point out a few things and I'll, uh, that uh, a few things that are really important technology for us. And uh, I'll kind of get to that here in a second, but you'll see as I go through. So all of our newest bags are bright yellow. Um, the reason why we like bright yellow is because you can see it. So when we're on a roadway, when we're taking care of patients in confined spaces or anything of that nature, we know what this bag is at all times. Um, inside the bag, you'll see we have some medications up here. We have a few pouches. We have some basic bandaging supplies, um, some trauma shears, a tourniquet, um, and then we have some uh, what we call oral glucose. This oral glucose is a really important tool for our diabetic patients. Um, EMTs, advanced EMTs, and paramedics might give this if we have a diabetic patient who is hypoglycemic, meaning their blood sugar is really low, and we have to bring their blood sugar back up. And so this is really good for them if they're able to swallow at the, at the moment. Sometimes we get there and they're either unresponsive or somewhat responsive and we don't really want to give anything by mouth just yet. And I'll go into how we fix that later on with something called dextrose and IVs. All right, so once you see in the bag, we have, our, we have three modules in this bag. We try to modularize everything so it's really easy grab and go. And when we're working on crew dynamics or when we're operating a crew resource model where we have individual paramedics, EMTs, or AMTs assigned to something, we can give them the bag and say, hey, you're on, for instance, you're on IV access or intravenous access. And this is our IV module. Or if we say, hey, we need you to give some medications. Once you get the IV, we might handle both modules because this is our medication module. And then we have something called the airway module. And our airway module is... Uh, it's kind of where we manage all of our airway issues. We do have some, we do have some redundancy within EMS and within the ambulance itself. We have some of the same equipment um, in a back cabinet. We have some of the same equipment in our uh, 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 oxygen bag and different things of that nature because it's always important to make sure that you have enough supplies within arm's reach whenever you need it. So let's start off by going through our intravenous module. This is our intravenous module. It has a clear opening so we can see what fluid that we have in there. There's a few fluids that we prefer. Traditionally, you probably heard of normal saline. And normal saline, normal saline is a really good uh, uh, fluid, uh, but it's not always preferential. Um, we might want to use lactated ringers, for instance, which is another type of fluid. And in here, we, we might find different types of fluid. In this case, when we look at this bag right here, we have sodium chloride or normal saline. And so that's the fluid that we have in here right now. Above me, we might have some lactated ringers that we can use. Here we have different IVs uh, so, uh, or IV catheters. So when we need to deliver a medication to a patient, we might have to start an IV on them. And the IV is literally just a, it's a sharp device that we stick into a vein, we pull out the needle and then we let, we're left with a catheter. And that catheter is, a, is an opening where we can provide fluids or medications directly into the venous system for the patient or in the veins for the patient. So we have different sizes, size of IV catheters. So for people with really small veins, we might want to use a 22 or a 24 gauge catheter. Where for somebody that has massive veins where we, can, where we want to get a lot of fluid or uh, something of that nature where we know if we go to the hospital they're going to get blood or something of that nature, we want to get a larger gauge IV. And that just means that the catheter is bigger. It allows us to give more fluid and or more blood more rapidly. A lot of what we do in EMS 
is to not only treat and stabilize the patient, but to prepare them for what they're going to go through when, we, when they get to the hospital. Their hospital course might involve a lot of advanced um, medications or uh, a lot of advanced therapies that they might need some of this stuff immediately when they come in. And we're kind of those, uh, we're kind of the gatekeepers there. We kind of provide that value to the hospital where, hey, we're going to do this for you so you can get the patient treated much more quickly. And so IVs are one of those uh, really essential tools for paramedics to perform. So, and then we have everything to secure an IV, to flush an IV, and things of that nature in this module. It's a really good module. Uh, you're probably going to see this on 90% of the uh, advanced life support calls that involve a paramedic. All right, so now we'll talk about the medication module. There's a lot of medications that EMS gives um, that our paramedics, our AMTs, and our EMTs might give. Uh, believe it or not, we, just, we don't just pick up and take you to the hospital. Uh, we provide a lot of value before you get to the hospital. Most of the time, we can treat and stabilize, uh, I would say, 90% of the injuries that we see or the illnesses that we see before we get to the hospital because it's going to be a while before you can actually see a physician and or see the specialty physician that you require at the hospital. So we want to make sure that we're doing that before we get to the hospital. And that gives all of those physicians some time to uh, really get their plan together and really get your plan of care worked out. All right, so we have some smaller syringes such as these. These are 1 ml syringes. We give a lot of medications in small dosages. We also have some larger syringes. So this for instance, is a 25 ml or cc syringe. We have medication drop sets. What that means is if we need to spike a bag of fluids, uh, put medication in those fluids, and then deliver those medications over time, which is called an infusion, we can do that. And so uh, that, that's helpful as well. There are a lot of infusions that we might give, um, uh, different types of infusions. We can go through that as we go through the medica medications. So inside here, we have a few medications. Here's a smaller bag of normal saline. This is uh, when we want to give uh, certain medications such as tranexamic acid or a ketamine infusion for pain or analgesia, for instance. Um, we have our MAD devices. So our MAD devices, that's just an acronym that they use. It's actually just a nasal atomizer device, and uh, that that atomizes the medication into the nostril. If, per se, we can't get an IV, but we don't want to progress into something such as a, an intraosseous needle, which is where we drill into the bone. We'll go through that in a second, and you'll see that too. It's pretty cool. All right, so this is our one of our medications that we give. It's called calcium chloride. Calcium chloride is, you know, sometimes patients might have electrolyte imbalances that uh, changes the rhythm uh, in their heart, and if that happens, then we might want to give this. Patients in cardiac arrest, for instance, that undergo renal dialysis uh, or kidney dialysis, um, they might need this because they might have too much potassium in their body, and this will stabilize that and bring their uh, acid-base balance to a, uh, to a normal range. All right, so another medication is our dextrose. And so this is what I was talking about earlier. We have oral glucose and we have dextrose. This dextrose comes what we call pre-mixed, so it's already mixed up in the bag for us. Um, this is a lower amount of dextrose. We used to give these large ampules of dextrose. Now we really only give 10% dextrose over a certain period of time or an infusion. Um, so, we don't, uh, so we don't risk too much glucose getting introduced to the patient and spiking their blood sugar way far up, way more than we needed it to or way more than we want it to be. And then, then, then they have to worry about giving themselves insulin because we've spiked it too high. Um, and so this allows us to kind of get it where we need it to be without spiking it so high that we, need to, that we need to think about another medication. Which can occasionally happen, especially with fragile, or, uh, with fragile diabetic patients. And then we have uh, lidocaine. Lidocaine is traditionally a numbing agent for us. This is a heart medication. Um, uh, we can give lidocaine for numbing, such as when we start an intraosseous needle or intraosseous line. Uh, but for the most part, we're going to use this to uh, stabilize heart tissue and uh, help heart tissue conduct the way it needs to conduct. Atropine, um, this kind of speeds up your heart um, in a way. Uh, this is kind of what we want to give it for. We give it for when your heart rate's really low and we want the heart rate to come back up. Um, this, we, we give this medication. 
Um, if that doesn't work, then we might give something called epinephrine, which is really an... This is uh, kind of the bread and butter of medications in EMS. We give it for cardiac arrest. We might give it if your veins are... Uh, are, are really dilated and we need to constrict your veins down so your blood pressure comes back up. Uh, we call it a vasopressor. And so that it, it just puts a lot of pressure on your veins to bring your heart, blood pressure back up when it's dangerously low. And so we can use it for that. We can use it in uh, allergic reactions or anaphylaxis when your airway is about to close because you've, um, uh, because you've been stung by a bee and you're allergic to it or uh, ate a strawberry or a peanut or something of that nature, anything you're allergic to and you're starting to have airway constriction or airway closure, this medication will save your life. It's truly uh, one of the most important medicines in EMS. Then we have naloxone. Naloxone has been, become really popular. A lot of people know about it because of the opioid crisis, uh, also called Narcan. Uh, naloxone is given for opiate overdoses. Opiate overdoses are simply that they've taken too much opiate, whether it be fentanyl, heroin, something of that nature. And this medication will uh, block those receptor sites and uh, bring them uh, to stop the, their respiratory uh, depression where they're not breathing the way that they should or they're not breathing at all. And it'll, it'll help them breathe again. It'll bring them back to a normal mental status. It's really beneficial. It's the antidote for an opioid overdose. Inside we have, we expand even further inside, and we have some more medications in our cool little, um, cool little pouches here. So we'll go through some of these medications. I'll try not. I'll try to keep it brief and not go through all of them because we get there's over a thousand individual pieces of equipment on an ambulance. Believe it or not, and that's a lot of equipment. So uh, so I'm not going to try to go through all of them, but um, we have stuff for an for anti nausea. So if you have nausea, vomiting, we have stuff for that in here, such as Zofran. Um, we have over here. We have. Benadryl, IV Benadryl. These are all IV medications or intraosseous medications. So this is what we're going to draw up in our syringes and give IV. So our Benadryl isn't in a tablet form. It's in an IV form. It's more concentrate. Well, not necessarily more concentrate, but it's, uh, it'll work a lot quicker because it's introduced a lot quicker and not digested in your stomach and, uh, get, and over time dispersed. So adenosine. Adenosine is a really important medication as well for our patients that have a really high heart rate. It's an arrhythmia called supraventricular tachycardia. Supraventricular tachycardia is very deadly. There are two ways we can fix supraventricular tachycardia. We can try adenosine. Adenosine is a, is a drug that will stop the, the re-entry of electrical signals from the uh, back into the atria. We have a re-entry. It's going too fast, right? So it'll stop that signal, block that signal, and it'll allow our heart to conduct from the nodes in the heart more efficiently. The other way is we can use our cardiac monitor here. And our cardiac monitor is really important there as well because we might want to use something called synchronized cardioversion where we hook them up to our pads much like you would see in a, a defibrillation or an automatic external defibrillator when in cardiac arrest. But we would hook them up to the pads and our monitor, which is a really cool piece of technology, our monitor would sense the heart rhythm, find something called the R wave, synchronize to that R wave, and deliver a, an, a defibrillation at that R wave at a certain energy level, and it would uh, it would help their heart get back to a normal rhythm. So those are the two ways we can we can treat that, and they're very important. This is not the preferred way. We would really like to use adenosine, um, but there is a, there is an abnormal sensation with adenosine that people talk about quite frequently. So, uh, but it's a lot better than getting shocked. So we try that first. Uh, then we've got glucogen, and glucogen is uh, something we also give for uh, diabetic patients. There's uh, a few other uses that we can give it for uh, a couple, uh, an overdose of some kind. Um, our tranexamic acid, tranexamic acid is a really neat uh, medication that we might give. Um, what it helps do is it, uh, it helps us um, clot a little bit faster. Uh, as that's the most simplistic way I can describe it. It helps, thing, it helps us clot a little bit faster. So if we have a, an external hemorrhage or we're bleeding out from an accident or an injury, um, then we might want to give this medication to uh, help clot a little bit more after we put the tourniquet on um, so that the patient loses less blood because the more blood they lose, the, more ch the higher the chance of their death. So we want to really try to prevent that. Tranexamic acid, really good drug for that. Um, then we have some more epinephrine 
And then we have something called solumedrol, which is a really neat looking, uh, really ne neat looking vial. It's actually a powder. This is a powder, and that powder actually, uh, that powder and that fluid, you pop it and it mixes together, and you try to reconstitute it because it has a very, it'll expire really quickly once uh, they're constituted together. So we have to mix those up after the fact. So you can tell there's a lot of medications in this medication bag. That doesn't include, we've got a lot more medications, but these are the bread and butter of the MS. This is what we want in every bag. Um, and then we'll get into the airway kit. Our airway kit has a lot has a has a few things in it as well. So we'll start here with uh, our McGill forceps. These McGill forceps are used if we need to pick uh, pick a piece of foreign object out of someone's throat because they're choking, and abdominal thrust hasn't worked. So uh, we'll put a laryngoscope, which I'll show you in a second, in, and we'll try to go down and pick it out. Um, and so that's a helpful tool. All right, we have our thoracostomy needles. All right, so um, these needles, actually, they're, they're sealed, so I'm not going to open one up. They're really long needles, all right? So they're especially long because we're not going to put this in a vein. Um, this particular needle is going to go in a chest. So when someone has something called a pneumothorax uh, or when they have air in the chest that's collapsing their lung and we need to relieve that air that's tensioning their lung, or it's called a tension pneumothorax, we're going to put this needle in their chest at a specific location and we're going to relieve that pressure. All right. Uh, we might have to do it multiple times so we have multiple needles because the pressure might, the, the, the uh, actual catheter might occlude or something of that nature. So we might have to do it multiple times to make sure that the pressure stays relieved till we get to the hospital. If we don't do this, quite frankly, the patient will die. And so that's, it's a very important skill. It's not frequent. It's not real. It doesn't occur every week basis or anything like that but it's something that if we if we don't have and we don't do the patient's likely going to die before we get to the hospital we have some endotracheal tubes and endotracheal tubes as you can see here uh, the endotracheal tubes will actually go into your mouth and down through your trachea uh, into your trachea so we can ventilate your lungs so we can breathe for you basically um, if you've ever watched Grey's Anatomy or any other medical show then intubation is something where they use a laryngoscope device and they try to find your vocal cords and they pass a tube through them and then they put you on a ventilator or they breathe for you with a bag valve mask. This is that tube that delivers that breath. We have different sizes because we might have, um, we might go from little babies all the way up to large adults. So we want to make sure that we have a, 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 the right amount of sizes so we can actually uh, get the right tube in the right patient at the right time. So. And in here, we also have our video laryngoscope. All right, so these are actually our older video laryngoscopes. We're transitioning to a new type of video laryngoscope pretty soon. We're going through the uh, recurrent training and the competencies for those right now. And uh, I can show you that when we do our station tour. But, um, and uh, these are really cool. Um, these video laryngoscopes have this plastic sheath that goes over top of them for, sanita for sanitary reasons. So after an intubation, we'll literally take this off and throw it away uh, and clean the rest of the device. But there is a camera down here. You can see that there's a light on and there's a camera right here. So this is a really cool piece of technology and piece of STEM and EMS. Um, traditionally, we had to do something called direct laryngoscopy before where we had to use some, uh, some old metal tools, which I'll show you here in a second because we still have those. But this has really improved our innovation success rates. It's important that we innovate you as quickly as we can on the first attempt. Um, and it, it's important that we have the tools to do that. Innovation is a really hard procedure, um, generally reserved for physicians, anesthesiologists, and paramedics. We don't really see many nurses doing it unless they're a CNR, CRNA or some, something of that nature, a nurse anesthetist, somebody that uh, has traditional training and does that for a living. So primarily it's physicians, anesthesiologists, uh, ER physicians, anesthesiologists, and paramedics. So uh, uh, we have the video, and you can see my hand in the video. Now, we would insert this in the patient's mouth, and we would look for the vocal cords. And I can show you that a little bit later on a mannequin. Um, and then we would pass that tube through those vocal cords, and then we would breathe for them. So that's a really cool device. That's our video laryngoscope. Now let's say, 
the video laryngoscope uh, uh, isn't working or something of that nature. We do have, uh, occasionally there are equipment failures with anything in technology. However, traditionally we've not had that occur before. So um, we do have uh, laryngoscope blades and these are traditional, uh, these are disposable blades as well. We'll throw these away after every uh, innovation attempt as well. They go all the way down to a pediatric size. This is a really small blade. This is for pediatrics or babies and kids. Or we'll go up to a, 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 to a large adult size and we'll use this, for instance. All right. So there are different types of blades, uh, Macintosh, Miller blades. Uh, but um, all of them are essentially to do the same thing, and that's provide a direct view of the vocal cords so we can pass the endotracheal tube. All right, let me turn this off and we'll move to another module. Now, another device that we actually have in here, um, a tube holder, but another device that we have here in here is something called a needle cricothyrotomy set. And that needle cricothyrotomy set is, let's say this fails, this fails, and then what we call a superglottic airway fails. Well, we have a redundancy for those as well, but it's a redundancy we don't like to use often because it's more surgical in nature. So. Essentially, if we can't get an airway on you, but you have to have one, as in we've got to breathe for you, you're not breathing on your own, but none of our equipment is working or we can't make it work because um, uh, you have a difficult anatomy or uh, a surgical uh, issue around your throat, then we might uh, find uh, your cricothyroid membrane, which is about right here, and we might stick a large bore needle through that cricothyroid membrane and then we would attach a ventilatory device such as a ventilator or a bag valve mask and breathe for you. So that's another cool device. It's just one more redundancy that paramedics have to learn how to do and have to be uh, competent in doing. Pretty soon we'll be transitioning to actual surgical uh, airways because uh, um, we think that they're, they're more fitting um, and they, they ventilate a little bit better, and that's basically making a surgical incision at that same location I was talking about and passing a, a smaller endotracheal tube through. So that's this module, really important module. Now another important module that you might have is, um, our, uh, uh, is our intraosseous set, and our intraosseous needles are here, so we have our intraosseous needles, and these needles, we use a drill. Um, it's an intraosseous drill, and it basically looks like a small drill. And uh, we drill into your bone to provide access um, for infusions, medication infusions, uh, fluid infusions, things of that nature. And so we need that. We need those needles because we might give them to pediatric patients that don't have any IVs, what, any veins whatsoever. Their veins are too small to get access. And so we might have to drill into their tibia. Um, for adults, we might see it in cardiac arrest a little bit more where we have to drill into their humeral, humerus bone up here. And so we might drill right about here. And so, you know, we, we want to make sure we get access for those patients if we really have to give them critical medications or things of that nature. In our front pocket, we have a few things. We have uh, uh, nitroglycerin and aspirin. These are really key for our uh, chest pain patients. We have a carbon monoxide detector that uh, um, that we're tr if we go into a dangerous environment where we need to measure carbon monoxide, it'll beep for us and things of that nature. We'll pull that out when we're uh, when we're concerned about going into a closed space. Um, we have our uh, sharps container. Um, we have our thermometer, uh, and then we have some uh, emesis or vomit bags when someone's having a uh, having a nauseated day. And then we have. In the top compartment, we have our blood pressure scope, blood pressure cuff, sorry, and our stethoscope. So our blood pressure uh, blood pressure cuff, excuse, excuse me, and our stethoscope. This is for taking blood pressures, listening to lung sounds, listening to heart tones, things of that nature. Down here we have a we have our SpO2 monitor. This is a portable SpO2 monitor. We have one here, and we have one on our cardiac monitor as well. When we have either multiple patients or uh, we want to check uh, uh, in, when pediatric patients, we might want to look at both sides to check for any type of uh, uh, cardiac defect or something of that nature. 
And then we have our blood glucose monitor. This is uh, where we would check blood glucose and correct any uh, hyper or hypoglycemia, too much blood sugar, too little blood sugar. All right, and that is the primary bag. Now this bag is gonna go in on every single patient. Every single patient is gonna have this bag in their home. All right, uh, um, it's bar none one of the most essential items. Another item that's gonna go into the house all the time is our cardiac monitor, which is another piece, a cool piece of technology. Um, back here, we have uh, just more fluids, uh, uh, some more pre-mixed medications that we might give. These are quick access for whoever's on this seat, which is called the bench seat. On this other one, we have even more medications. Um, and these medications are really important for our cardiac arrest patients, things of that nature. Sometimes they get, uh, uh, they get jumbled around as the ambulance bounces and things of that nature. We also have uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol for, kid, or for adults and kids. We have inhaler, a meter dose inhaler. We recently started doing meter dose inhaler over uh, traditional nebulized medications um, because of COVID-19. We have a method of administering this that prevents any aerosols. Aerosols are particularly dangerous in COVID-19 because uh, it's, it, that's the number one transmission of COVID-19. So we wanna make sure whenever we're using aerosol procedures, we wanna have an N95 mask on, make sure we have full PPE, a gown, gloves, eye protection, um, things of that nature. Um, sodium bicarbonate, which is uh, not the same, but uh, similar in usage to the calcium chloride that we saw earlier. We might give this to those patients that um, have uh, wide complex arrhythmias um, that uh, we're worried about uh, electrolyte imbalances. We have a medication here called Duodote. Um, it's a medication that we generally give for uh, nerve agent exposures. We are CSEP County, very close to here. Uh, very close to here, if you're not familiar, uh, very close to here in Richmond, Kentucky, we have a uh, chemical agent stockpile facility a facility that uh, disposes of chemical agents. It's one of the last ones in America, and uh, they're destroying chemical agents all the time. And as part of that CSEP County, we want to make sure that we always have uh, antidotes for nerve agents on hand at all times in case we have an incident where there's a leak at that facility. In addition, um, nerve agents are commonly found in pesticides. And so any pesticide that you might use might have nerve agents. Um, uh, farmers uh, are traditionally at risk for pesticide or nerve agent exposure because of some of the chemicals they use. And so we have those on hand as well. And uh, some of the other things that we've already kind of talked about in here. So I won't go too much in depth there. Thanks for watching. If you would like to see more STEM with Chantel videos, check out this playlist. If you want to know when JCPL puts out more content, click the subscribe button and the notification bell.